G'day investors and welcome to another episode of Stocks to Watch. My name's John Franklin, an experienced exploration geo and your host. Today we're taking a dive into Iron Ear Limited, an Aussie explorer with integrated lithium boron projects in the entire world. I'm joined today by the Managing Director, Bernard Rowe. Firstly, welcome to the show, Bernard. Thanks, John. Good to be with you again. It's great to be talking again. And you've had some exciting upside recently. You recently announced that the project economics of Rylite Ridge for the lithium boron project have improved significantly. Costs are lower, projected profits are higher. So do you want us to run us through the main factors that are that have affected this? Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. Yeah, sure. Happy to do so. So firstly, Rylite Ridge is a really large deposit. So we have a lot of flexibility about, you know, how we sequence and process the ore. And we have two ore types. One's high in boron and high in lithium. The other's low in boron and high in lithium. And we blend those together to process them. But we've got hundreds of millions of tonnes of that material. So what, what we did to improve the project economics was that we looked at being more efficient with our acid leaching. We, we extract the lithium and the boron from hard rock and we convert it into uh, boron and lithium chemicals at the site and through that leaching process. Now, if we can be more efficient with our acid, i.e. use less acid per tonne of uh, ore processed, that improves our economics. So we, we reduce the amount of time that we leach for from three days down to two and then one, down to one and a half days, so effectively half the leach time. Recovery is a little bit lower because of that, but we easily make up for it by being able to process more tonnes of ore. And as I said, there's, there's a lot of tonnes of ore here. So far, you know, higher production rate, faster processing, more tonnes per day is not a problem for us. And that's what's led to this significant improvement in economics. So is this is part of basically like a feed study, trying to find the balance of, of uh, yeah, tons through versus grade versus recovery. Yeah. Exactly. It's, a, it's an optimization. It doesn't change the process at all. And in fact, we're not even going to change the amount of acid that we are actually generating. That's fixed. It's, it's that we have this spare acid because we're leaching faster, so we're using less acid for the tonnes that we were processing, and that's allowing us to process more tonnes. And just to put it into some kind of perspective, we, we're, we're actually generating about 20% more lithium and boron, and we're processing about 40% more ore. So some acid... The quantity of acid stays the same, but we're processing 40% more ore. Now, you can only do that when you've got a large deposit because you're not so as worried about the recovery. So you take a little bit of a haircut on the recoveries, but you process more ore. And yes, as you describe it, it's, it's an optimization of a process that we have developed, you know, six years ago now, and it hasn't changed. The process is exactly the same. The capital and the equipment to do it is exactly the same. Fantastic. So that's that's the kind of the production output or throughput side of things. If we now shift over to the, the cost side of the equation, the all-in sustaining cost is now reported at 4628 per metric tonne of lithium carbonate, which is obviously much lower than the spot price. How does this compare with your previous cost estimates and, and what, what measures did you put in place to, to allow this to happen? So yes, it's a significant reduction. You know, we were we were down, we were around about five and a half thousand dollars per ton of carbonate, and now we're well into the fours, mid fours, and so you know it's a substantial decrease in the cost. Now, of course, the cost per ton of carbonate is very much dependent on how much carbonate you produce. So we're producing more, as I said, about twenty percent more. Uh, carbonate and the costs are much the same because our biggest costs are reagents and transportation so they're not changing the, they're, they're our main operating costs so they're the same um, and so you know we, we, we're not changing the cost significantly and yet we're producing quite a lot more lithium uh, but here's the here's the real I guess the the, the key here is that we're also producing 20 percent more boron in doing this. And 20% more boron 
then provides a significant increase in the amount of revenue from that boron. And to calculate our lith cost of producing a tonne of lithium carbonate, we apply the boron as a credit because for every one tonne of lithium we produce, then we produce about seven tonnes of boric acid. Now, the, the ratio of one to seven, we can increase that up to about eight to one, or we can decrease it down to more like four and five to one, depending on that feed that I mentioned of whether we're putting in high or low boron ore, and we've got the option to vary that. So, but anyway, the boron at, at let's say around about an average of around about seven tonnes per tonne of lithium carbonate for our higher boron ore, that seven tonnes is equivalent to about $7,000. It's about $1,000 a tonne. And we apply that as a credit and against those costs. And, and that leaves us with an incredibly low cost to produce a tonne of lithium carbonate around that 4000 you know, mid $4,000 per tonne. And okay. I think it's worth also stressing or pointing out here that you know, this is, as far as I'm aware, this is the only hard rock lithium deposit in the world where you have a co-product that's producing about 30% of your revenue. And that's the really the key to getting that cost of carbonate so low. It's the quantum of that revenue that's coming from your co-product. And remembering you're producing lithium chemicals at the site, which is also incredibly rare for a hard rock lithium deposit. Yeah, and I find that being able to shift the metallurgy throughput to, to be able to change the ratio of the boron to lithium, that you'll really be able to take advantage of high versus low prices of boron and be able to ride the wave of, of volatility a lot more, I assume. Is, is, that the, is that the kind of the thought process behind it? Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it gives you a lot of flexibility and a lot of resiliency, resiliency, depending on what the pricing environment is at the time. And, you know, the, the things that are important to us in terms of pricing are three. It's the price of lithium, it's the price of boron, and it's the price of sulfur to make sulfuric acid. And we've got the ability to move those things around depending on what those pricing environments are like at any particular time. So we can, uh, and just, just again, to put this into some kind of perspective, in a low year, we might be producing 50 or fifty or 60,000 tonnes of boric acid a year. But in a high year, high year, we could be producing somewhere between 150 and 200,000 tonnes of boric acid a year. Now, you don't want that to be changing year by year. So I'm comparing you know, more like a period of a decade where, in you know, if you wanted to be having low boron production in the early years as you're ramping up, we can do that. And, and the numbers are around about, you know, 60, 70,000 tonnes a year. When you're in full production and the demand is there, uh, then you can be increasing that boric acid production from, you know, around about 100,000 up to a peak of around about closer to 200,000 tonnes a year. Yeah, great. That sounds like optionality to me, which is which is always a good thing to have. Um, so you mentioned boron. So let's jump into into boron a little bit. What kind of why is boron important to the US? Why is it important to the United States? Well, that's also pretty straightforward to answer because the US uses a lot of it. And in fact, most developed countries use a lot of boron because it's used in so many different applications. So it's very dissimilar to lithium, which is primarily used in batteries for EVs, but also static storage, whereas boron is used in more than 300 different separate applications. And they are incredibly diverse, those applications, everything from treating timber to stop termites and, and uh, white ants, so in the building industry, all the way through to armour plating on tanks and heat shields on rockets to stop rockets burning up when they re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. They have, they have boron tiles on the outer surfaces of those rockets to, to protect them. So it, it's used in a myriad of applications. The US is a big consumer of it. 
it's needed in everyday life because, you know, rockets and armour plating are obviously specialised areas. It's used as a micronutrient in agriculture. It's used in fibreglass insulation in a home building. I've already mentioned the termites and white ants. So, and borosilicate glass, the glass on your phone or on your tablet or even on your screen, TV screens, borosilicate glass. The glass on your cooktop in a kitchen that can be heat resistant and, and also in an oven, borosilicate glass. So it's a myriad of applications. It's a large market for it in the United States and it's got critical strategic material or it is a strategic material for both energy security and for military security. That's why it's so important for the United States. Absolutely. It sounds like it's critical just by definition of there being supply constraints on it by the way you by the way you kind of defined it there. Yeah. Well, that that's right and and again a number that I didn't mention is that 73% of the world's reserves of boron are in Turkey. So it's incredibly concentrated, the distribution of these deposits. It's just an unusual geological setting that you need to form these deposits and preserve them. And it's really only the southwest of the United States and Turkey where they are found in la as large deposits. There's a few other smaller ones in various parts of the world, but the big deposits are in southwest US and Turkey. Fantastic. Yeah, it's yeah, it's an exciting little uh, niche product that you don't hear much about. But then when you actually hear the list of products that it goes into, you go like, why isn't this? Why doesn't everyone know about boron? But yeah, now it sounds like people will wake up soon. So just in, in wrapping up, finally, you, you've achieved a lot of substantial progress to date. What, in your view, makes Ioneer a compelling investment opportunity for, for potential or existing investors? I think first and foremost is that our project is in a is in a rather unique position in the United States. It's ready to build. It's fully permitted. It has its offtakes in place. All the engineering is done. It's truly ready to build. Now, there's not many mineral deposits that you can say that about in the United States, and so that puts it in a in a category of its own. But you know, just as important or, you know, perhaps even more importantly, it's going to produce the end products, the, the refined chemicals at the mine site, which will allow the United States to start to build out the downstream processing for which it's currently reliant on overseas countries. And this administration is 100% committed to developing those complete supply chains, not just a mine to produce the raw material and sending it somewhere else, but the complete supply chain. So that's an important thing. And I think also, again, in this geopolitical environment, it's important because it's a large, long life mine in the United States with a chemical plant. It's going to employ a lot of people. It's going to contribute a lot of money into a very poor rural part of Nevada the wonderful community, but it's, you know, there's very few opportunities. So it's going to be a major economic contributor and employer. And that's also very important for this project. Obviously, you know, the government interest is already obvious with this project. We've managed to secure a billion dollars of long-term low-cost debt through the Department of Energy. So we've already got visibility on that strong government support the fact that we got the project permitted in six years is also speaks to the strong support from the government. Fantastic. Yeah, there's some, some compelling investment decisions there. So as I said before, you're listed on the ASX, so, so people can find you there. What's, what's your ticker code? The ticker code on the ASX is IN Indigo November Romeo, IN, and then we're also listed on the NASDAQ, and that's IONR. Great. All right. Well, it was a pleasure talking to you again, Bernard, and, and looking forward to following this story further. Great. Thanks, John.